Um, good evening and a warm welcome to our sixth Eclipse webinar. My name is Dr. Marta Jaskowska. I work at SWPS University in Poland, uh, which is a co-organizer of Eclipse webinars. Today, we will have a great pleasure to listen to a keynote lecture given by Professor Frank Nona from Bielefeld University in Germany. Uh, Frank is a clinical psychologist um, and one of leading experts on traumatic stress. He has published the first randomized treatment trial for post-traumatic stress disorder for refugees. Uh, Professor Nona will be joined uh, for a discussion by our very own Professor Agnieszka Popiel, who is a psychiatrist, a therapist, and who, uh, of course, established and co is now a co-founder, co-head of SWPS University Clinic of Cognitive Behavior Therapy. Uh, Professor Popiel specializes in the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of post-traumatic stress disorder. Last but not least, I wish to thank the audience for joining us live tonight and all of the of us, all of you who will be watching us later. And um, for the audience who are present here live, please use the chat function to ask the question. And we will aim to answer as many of them as possible. And now over to you, Frank. Thank you. Yeah, Marta, thank, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm quite happy um, to present here towards this. Yeah, this distinguished audience. Um, I'm going to talk about um, our experiences in the treatment of war affected populations and refugees. Um, and that I think is not only important for people who do work with refugees, but we have learned something I think that um, goes beyond uh, and is important beyond only um, the treatment of refugees um, that has some implications for the general perspectives of trauma-related disorders, of psychopathology in general, um, and for psychotherapy. So the aim of my presentation today is that I want to challenge some core assumptions between uh, behind post-traumatic stress disorder and behind uh, treatment of refugees and behind treatment in general from what we have learned. I'm aware that for some of you, I'm not telling um, a lot of new stuff because some of the things I'm going to tell to you is what especially many practitioners have ever known. But it has not really found its way into practice. And I think it's time to reconsider um, some important issues. Um, I will talk very, very briefly only today about narrative exposure therapy. Um, I am more going to talk about the theory and the conceptualizations behind it, because in my opinion, theory is more important than a manual because it will guide your clinical activities and your clinical actions and your clinical practice. And you will always encounter some problems with some patient where there's no solution in the manual. And then you need a proper theory that you can follow on. Uh, uh, so be prepared for some, I hope not too boring theory as implications um, of some challenged assumptions. So this is where my experience comes from. In recent uh, years, we had been working with the various populations across the world in various countries, uh, various war-affected populations, most recently with refugees and IDPs in Iraq, and um, also with refugees in Germany who've come to Germany. Um, still, um, we have very, very many refugees coming to Germany every year, bringing along um, challenges for the German healthcare system and for healthcare systems uh, internationally. The work I'm going to present today and the um, topics I'm going to present today cannot only be attributed to me, but to my wonderful team. Um, so I will not highlight some names right now, but I just emphasize that it's all of that is the work of wonderful PhD students and postdocs uh, in my team, um, some of them also from these countries um, who are still um, working for me. So let's challenge assumptions. And these are the three assumptions I'm going to challenge right now. Um, the first assumption is that trauma-related disorders such as PTSD are regularly caused by single traumatic events. Um, 
I guess many practitioners are aware of the fact that this core assumption is problematic um, and needs to be challenged. But if it's not the case that there is a single traumatic event that is outstanding to an extent that we can refer um, trauma symptoms to that single event, then this has implications for PTSD diagnosis, for PTSD theory and for PTSD treatment. And we have to take these consequences serious. The second uh, issue I want to question is to what extent physical trauma is really more severe than social trauma because that is an implicit assumption behind the PTSD concept um, that requires uh, the presence of a physically threatening event in the A criteria of post-traumatic stress disorder. So we can apply post-traumatic stress disorder only to events that present a harm to life or, or limb of a person, but not to other events that, uh, in exclamation marks, only uh, threaten the social integrity of a person. And the third issue um, I want to question is um, for the implications for treatment is the general assumption that we have in providing uh, treatment for trauma-related disorders and for many um, mental health conditions that um, we can expect patients to come to psychotherapists and receive treatment. And this is something that simply doesn't happen for refugees. They simply don't come to treatment. And refugees are not the only ones. So um, I think there are many people in our society who simply don't come for treatment. And we need a solution for that. So we have a selection of people who come for treatment. And I will suggest the very simple idea, if people don't come, then we have to go there and get them. So that would be the core idea. So one assumption after the other, the first assumption, the single trauma assumption. So that is post the classical idea of post-traumatic stress disorder. As it's still an implicit assumption behind the concept, many questionnaires and many theories. So the idea is that you have a happy person uh, who has led a happy life and then suddenly encounters something bad. And then through that bad event, finally, she is tra or he is traumatized. That is the idea behind um, the idea of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but unfortunately, this basic assumption is wrong. Um, the idea is that in, within the mere term of post-traumatic uh, implies that we can divide the life into a period pre-traumatic and post-traumatic. And we do have some questionnaires, not only on post-traumatic stress, but also on post-traumatic growth, for example, that ask a respondents to um, compare their lives between the trauma, uh, before the trauma and after the trauma. Um, but we always face problems with this type of questioning. And um, so especially if you take um, the gold standard um, diagnostic instrument for post-traumatic stress disorder. That would be the clinician assisted administered post-traumatic stress scale, the CAPS. Everyone in the trauma field is supposed to use the CAPS. Um, and the other scales, the PCL5, for example, all the standard scales, they require the interviewer to, de uh, um, to define this worst event um, for the patient, which would be the index event, and you would relate all symptoms to that single event. We always face problems with that in our uh, interviews with the refugees, because our refugees bring along uh, multiple traumatic events. The second core assumption I'm going um, to challenge is the physical threat assumption. And the physical threat as assumption originates in the classical stress theories. And if you read classical textbooks on stress, almost all classical textbooks on the psychology of stress start uh, with a picture of an uh, ancient human being running away from a lion. And that's the origins of the stress response. So it's a physical threat. It's a threat for survival that determines the stress response. And this idea as the worst that can happen to human is a threat for life is 
implied again by definition in the PTSD concept. It is not an empirical, it's not a research decision, it is a decision by definition. Because we have that gateway criterion, post-traumatic stress disorder is the only disorder where we do have such a gateway criterion. So we have an A criterion where we say it's not only the symptoms that matter, but also where the symptoms come from. Um, if someone does have the same symptoms from bullying, for example, that wouldn't count because bullying would not fulfill the A criterion. It is no threat to life of a person, no threat to health or of a person, and it's no sexual violence. So um, it is by def definition no post-traumatic stress disorder. The key assumption behind that, and there had also been some argumentations about that, is that we will want to limit the PTSD concept to the most severe conditions and the most severe events. And it had been argued that we want to prevent um, harm inflation. We want to prevent the perspective that everything in life can be harmful. So let's restrict our perspective on events that are really bad. Um, but there is a confusion here. So the assumption again is, and that assumption requires empirical questioning or justification, to what extent is it really the physical threatening events that are more harmful than the socially threatening events? To what extent are they really worse or more painful? So even if I were to agree that we would restrict post-traumatic stress disorder on the more severe events, is it then a good definition to restrict it to physical traumatizing events? So let's talk a bit about theory and trauma theory. And in the field of post-traumatic stress disorder, we are very, very fortunate in terms of theory because there's a strong consensus on theory. Um, and we have quite some trauma-focused theories. And if you summarize them, I'm drawing a lot on, on Chris Bruin's work here, but other people more or less say the same. So basically the idea is post-traumatic stress disorder is a disorder of the memory. So we have a dysfunctional pathological representation of a traumatic event in memory. And if you look into more detail, uh, then we have different structures in memory. We have a fear structure, an autobiography, and a self-concept, three different representations of a traumatic event um, where the event is encoded. And I'm going through into a little bit more detail about what is known about the fear structure and the autobiography to check what are the implications for theory if it's not a single event. And what are the implications for theory if we include social traumas um, within that framework? So the original idea um, behind these associative networks is that associative networks are more or less conditioned uh, memory structures that encode into an associative network the experience that occurred during the traumatic event. And the problem about of traumatic events is that during traumatic events, our reactions are not limited just to the classical stress response, which would be flight or fight. But we do have a variance of quite atypical abnormal um, stress reactions, including, for example, the fright or tonic immobility. This is something we would not encounter in typical stress reactions, but only in very, very intense stresses. So we freeze under a high arousal, which feels very, very strange. Usually we are not immobile under high arousal, but we are highly mobile. And we have such dissociative responses like the flag and even faint response. Um, so um, people during traumatic events in a resignative attitude, um, their, their uh, physiological arousal gets down, not high, during the stress response. Um, they dissociate. They lose the contact to reality. And all these different types of reactions that had occurred during the traumatic event are then conditioned in what Edna Four has called a fear structure. Fear structure is already probably not the right word because it's not restricted to fear. So all these types of reactions and emotions can be conditioned to a network that encodes the situation and the experiences during the traumatic events, the sensory, cognitive, emotional, and physiological responses, 
So something like a person has been attacked by a soldier and it is the voice of the soldier, the uniforms, that um, auditory information also that had been present during the traumatic event that get conditioned to the basic appraisals of the event, to the emotional reactions and to the physiological reactions. And we know that um, those types of encodings per se are not pathological, but um, in post-traumatic stress disorder, we have extensive representations of that type with a very strong connection between um, individual items of that associative networks, which means that the likelihood that uh, many aspects of that network get activated by reminder cues is quite high. And uh, it is... Uh, and as soon as many of these items get activated, we have intrusive experiences. And if the whole structure is getting activated, we have what we call a flashback, which means a re-experiencing of that event, including the emotions and the physiological reactions of that event. But these associative networks are not the only networks that encode the traumatic event. Fortunately, um, we do also have a different um, structure that is um, encoding different aspects and that is what we call the autobiographic memory. The autobiographic memory is a completely different representation of an event. The autobiographic memory is not associative but it's a well-structured cognitive elaborative um, encoding of personal experiences um, that follow a temporal sequence and that encode time and space, where something has happened, what has happened, uh, and what the meaning of the event was for the personal life. Those, this enables us to tell stories about our life, to put the events into words. What happens in post-traumatic stress disorder, and there's some good evidence that we have very strong representations of these associative structures, but very weak autobiographical representations. And this is one reason why survivors of traumatic events have difficulties to report the events, because they simply lack the cognitive encoding um, of the autobiography. They simply don't have that representation in a very proper uh, way. And the reason for that must, might just be neurobiological. It must, might just be that the hippocampus that plays an important role in autobiographical encoding is uh, impaired um, due to stress hormones in situations of intense stress. So it might just be a biological interference of memory systems that leads to a pathological memory encoding. So that is the theory if we relate it to a single traumatic event. But um, for what I show you right here is a result of uh, what we are doing in therapy. And what we are doing in therapy, and as part of some of you will know, narrative exposure therapy, we have what we use, what we call it the lifeline exercise. So in the beginning of treatment, we ask people to lay down a rope and to use two types of symbols, stones for bad events and flowers for good events and assisted with the therapist, they lay down the key events of their lives in a chronological order. And this is the lifeline of a refugee, uh, an adolescent that I've been treating recently. And already here you can see it is not a single outstanding um, traumatic event. Uh, it, this refugee had been surviving a severe massacre uh, in the war in Iraq, um, but it, the lifeline started with the, with the death of the parents, followed by a sexual abuse, um, followed by several wars, by the rape of the sister. And um, I would have very much problems now to define the index trauma here. So I would be supposed uh, in the questionnaire to ask this client now, so which of these events is the best event? And uh, Typically, many people simply can't decide. And those who decide quite often during treatment, they change their perspective. And if I relate their symptoms to events, then I quite often find they have symptoms related to different events. So from a clinical perspective, this focus on single events 
within our refugee population and refugees are not the only population we also we have the same difficulties with survivors of child abuse for example we also have series of traumatic events not as the exception but as the standard and this is not uncommon and we see it in in in, in all our survey data we have on refugees And this is the most stable effect we see in all our uh, epidemiological studies. And in fact, that effect is so stable that we use it now um, to see if we have proper data. So this is the dosage effect. So we see that the likelihood of developing a post-traumatic stress disorder um, is linearly associated with the number of traumatic event types a person has experienced. So if it's just a few number of event types like zero to three, then the likelihood of developing post-traumatic stress disorder is there, but it's quite low. And the majority will have a series of traumatic events during their life course uh, as the standard. And um, we, we, we find that in all of our studies and And this is results of a, of a different study that we have carried out in uh, with Iraqi refugees um, uh, with with uh, Yazidi women, and what we find also there we were considering there must be a key event that is outstanding because many of them had been enslaved by the ISIS forces and had been abducted and had been forced um, to all kinds of brutalities, but also here. It is multiple events, um, it is partner violence, it is war-related traumatic events, it is other family members affected by, I by ISIS that do predict um, post-traumatic stress disorder and it's not a single event and not even a single event type. So in severely affected populations like refugees, what we expect is that multiple types of traumatic events is the normality and we would expect an effect that we is known within developmental psychopathology as the so-called pile-up effect, which means that once you have one risk factor, the likelihood that you have another risk factor is higher. So risk factors seem to accumulate, and the same is true for traumatic events. So you would have multiple risk factors uh, in single persons and multiple traumatizations in multiple persons. Um, so The definition of pre- and post-trauma periods is sometimes obsolete and the identification of single burst events is often impossible within our populations. So let's challenge the other assumption, um, the physical threat assumption. Um, the physical threat assumption, um, again, from one of our studies um, we have carried out with uh, former Uh, abductees of the ISIS uh, in Iraq and what you see here I won't go into details but what you can see in the explanation of post-traumatic stress disorder we find one key mechanism and the key mechanism is not related to memory of physical traumatic events but it is related to um, social exclusion that these women experience uh, within their community. So with these questions, are you worried about not getting married now? Do you feel excluded by your family? Do you feel excluded by members of your community? We see that we have additional events, additional stresses and additional traumatic events that occur right now and that are not less severe and in fact play a major role, not as a moderating, um, but as a mediating factor in explaining post-traumatic stress disorder. And this comes quite along if we see about social factors. Social factors in post-traumatic stress disorder have mainly been seen as protective factors, as social support, for example, as protective factors. But that is only one side of the coin of social factors because social events cannot only be protective. Social events can also be extremely harmful. And we know that from all research on emotional abuse and peer victimization, We know that emotional abuse, and that would be f verbal types of abuse. Um, I've always, I, to be very honest, I've always underestimated emotional abuse. 
before I worked clinically in detail with the victims of different types of abuse. Verbal abuse, for example, means that your parents tell you that uh, they wish that you would have never been born, for example. That is a strong message, that is a hurtful message, that's a painful message, and that's also a harmful message. Because what we see is that um, if we do multivariate analysis of all types of child maltreatment, It is always emotional abuse that is outstanding and quite often outperforms the impact of physical abuse and sexual abuse. Um, same is true for peer victimization and bullying. A very strong independent factor. It is not the physical threat that um, students encounter, for example, in school, but it's rejection and exclusion and explains a lot of variants in later psychopathology, also in longitudinal studies. So we know that we don't need any physical threat to be traumatized by socially traumatizing events. Um, but we didn't relate that to post-traumatic stress disorder yet. So let's do it. Let's relate it to post-traumatic stress disorder. And then what would be the consequences for the theory? For the theory, um, we would have to take so the threats to social integrity very serious because from a sociobiological perspective, we know, of course, why threat for life and limb is stressful. But we have to take very serious why a threat for um, two key social motives is as threatful and the key social motives would be um, the affiliation and the social rank. So, because in all human mankind, it had been extremely important for single human beings to be protected within groups. As an outsider, uh, basically, uh, exclusion from your society uh, would equal a death penalty because you would have no zero chance to survive in a wild environment. Uh, and the same is true for social rank within the community. So social rank determines the amount of privileges you would have within your community and the resources you get. So a threat to the social rank, a threat to be important within your group um, is a built-in stressor that requires a very intense stress response. And this is what we find. We find in experimental studies extremely strong stress responses, not only to physical stresses, but also to social stresses that had been described, um, for example, as the protest despair response since Bowlby, for example, um, and in um, animal studies that had been described as the defeat response. The defeat response is one of the key animal models, for example, for depression. And the defeat response is nothing else but a threat to the social status of an animal by having an intruder animal that is higher in rank, um, that is more or less humiliating that poor animal. The same we find in human beings and we find the same defeat reaction as we find here. We won't go into too much detail now, but uh, I'd recently written a an, an, uh, review article in Clinical Psychology Review where I've summarized these different types of responses to physical and social stresses. And um, we find strong peritraumatic reactions um, that remarkably resemble um, there's a remarkable physiological equivalence between f reactions to physical and social stressors in the types of reactions. We just have different names and we have less names for these reactions uh, in, in colloquial terms. We have no collo very good colloquial term for an effect that is called um, defeat, for example. We know defeat, but I feel defeated that is rarely being used. But we all know this sensation if we are severely humiliated and to feel defeated to an extent to that. Um, so we do have these intense reactions. Um, to simplify, uh, in, we, would, uh, we have called uh, a certain type of response of intense social stresses the devaluation. That has now a term that many people, and we have developed a self-report questionnaire about um, what that feels like of being devaluated. It 
comes along with emotions such as shame or humiliation. It comes along with the appraisals of um, being excluded, of your honor being uh, threatened. It comes along with low physiology. It comes along with paralysis. It comes along with a numbed sensation. And it comes along with a lot of intentions of what you would want to do. But you feel helpless and you will not do it. So like helpless anger, for example, um, but you feel stuck. Uh, you want to disappear. You want to hide. You want to disappear into the ground. And we define that as an effect of devaluation. And we have developed a self-report instrument on that that has a very high, in uh, high internal consistency in various applications and in various translations. Um, but we simply lack the colloquial term for that. So if we relate that idea now to PTSD theory, then the implication would be that we do have associative networks not only about physical threat reactions, but also on social threat reactions. So we would have devaluative aspect within these networks. Um, and as we do not have a single event, what we would have expect um, is more extended networks um, on associative memories, um, for example, on single traumatic events, like, for example, here in this example, the experience of a child that we had ex examined after the tsunami in Sri Lanka, interrelated with war experiences um, that that child also had to experience. And then again, interrelated with uh, uh, with emotional abuse and physical abuse that this child had endured uh, in her family as a response um, of traumatized parents. So we would have not three different um, associative networks per type, but we would have a huge associative network about traumatic experiences. And since we have some repetitive experiences, we do also have some outstanding uh, elements um, that become easily activated um, because they had been activated over and over again in series of traumatic, social and physically traumatic events. So this is what we have. And as an empirical finding, um, for example, here uh, within uh, Iraqi refugees, we uh, no, so that was Syrian refugees in Iraq, we could confirm that that effect of social devaluation, and we were relating it in this way to this um, social devaluation as a refugee living in Iraq. Uh, and they are living under very restrained conditions. Um, and the extent to what they feel social devaluated as a refugee is a strong mediator between not only the social stressors, but also the traumatic stressors and different types of psychopathology that we have. It's not a full mediation, but it's a partial mediation. And it's also related to traumatic stressors because we have to be aware that also traumatic stressors quite often carry an emotional message and a social message of exclusion, of humiliation, of being worthless to having to endure such a classical traumatic stressor. So briefly, what are the implications for therapy? Uh, what can we do about it? And how in this way, in viewing therapy, would we have to challenge again new assumptions? And the first thing I have to emphasize is um, if we take it serious, that it's devaluation that matters so much um, in uh, creating psychopathology, then the first means, of course, is not treatment. The first means is that we have to take aware that many of the refugees living in um, low income or also in Western countries still experience devaluation. So they are still in the middle of trauma. And I'll just give you one example. Um, the guy you see there, Friedrich Merz, um, is the head of the Christian Democrat Party in Germany, probably running for chancellor next time. So not unlikely that this person is going to be the next chancellor. And it's one, it is not just the case that we want to restrict migration and we want to close borders. And there might be different opinions about that. And we could even decide on, on doing that and restrict migration. But what we should not do, um, have um, statements like this, 
and um, questioning the motivation of refugees and uh, saying that say they sit at the doctors and have their teeth redone as if that was the key problem of refugees and the key motivation to come to Germany is to have your tooth redone. And that is not just a hurtful message for those who had experienced multiple traumatic events, but it's also a harmful message for those. And we have to reconsider the way we talk about refugees. But it has also uh, implications for mental health care. And we have done a couple of studies on mental health care of refugees in Germany. And this is just uh, one of these studies. And we have found the same uh, results uh, at uh, various studies. And this is was now carried out in Bielefeld, uh, where our university is. And we have just studied a convenient random sample of refugees, an unselected sample. And what we have de determined is the objective need for some kind of mental health assistant in more than 50% of those unselected refugees. And that is not uncommon, and this is uh, quite consistent with the international literature on refugees. Um, if you see the subjective need, which means to what extent are the refugees themselves aware that they would need treatment and there is something like treatment for the condition is considerably lower, um, then uh, Again, what is considerably lower is the number of those who had contact to any mental health worker. Um, we know that the first line treatment would be psychotherapy. And again, then we are already at about three to four percent who had ever contact to a psychotherapist. Those who had received psychotherapy with more than five percent, five sessions is already below five percent. And none of them had received any type of evidence based psychotherapy. And I'm, this can be basically, I guess, generalized um, to, um, I would guess, to many refugees living in very many countries. Um, we have several reasons for this. Of course, there are many structural barriers to receive psychotherapy uh, in Germany. Yeah. So we have barriers... Um, um, on the side of the refugees because simply they don't speak the language and they are not aware of um, psychological trauma. But I would also emphasize on the barriers on the side of the psychotherapists. And we have done a survey of psychotherapists in Germany, um, a large scale vignette experiment. So we have sent all of them cases and asked them, okay, what do you feel about that treatment? What would you expect and what would you recommend? And we had varied the cases, um, so everyone had received a different case report and we had varied two factors. One was the gender of the patient and the other was um, they were both PTSD patients and one was quite obviously a refugee and the other was has a German name and was no refugee. And just to summarize the result, um, we, we were seeing far more therapy hindering attitudes uh, in all domains um, for the refugees which means they would expect uh, more difficult therapy, they would um, expect a more difficult alliance, and they would expect more fear, they would more often recommend not psychotherapy, but medication, for example. They would have more worries um, for, for refugees. And I would agree that probably refugees are no easy um, patients, but neither are German patients. They are also not easy. And I've seen so many complex traumatized Germans that I would say uh, many of the complex traumatized Germans I've been seeing are more, have been more, far more difficult to treat than some refugees. So, but we have these attitudes also among refugees that might explain why um, they simply land within the German healthcare systems, beside all the obvious structural barriers and the key barrier is always the language problem. We have no paid interpreters. So if the refugees don't come, we have to go there. Uh, I won't go into detail of that, but that is a model we have developed as a screening of newly arriving refugees. And um, so what we have carried out in a, in a, uh, in a Bielefeld um, refugee home with newly arriving refugees, just a very, very brief um, screening um, carried out by lay workers who could speak the local languages with the very brief screening instrument. And we have called that study um, 
hello, how are you doing? That's how we had framed it. We, and what we found out is that refugees were very happy that finally someone was asking them how they are doing. And what we found out is what was not just some need for treatment, but we were finding many of red flags. So 7% of the cases were in severe crisis that they needed immediate intervention and they needed inter immediate referral, for example, to inpatient treatment and to some protective measures, which no one else would have seen. Of course, finally, I want, if we want uh, to challenge all these needs that we have faced before, um, my personal recommendation would be narrative exposure therapy. Um, briefly about narrative exposure therapy, what the difference would be is that narrative exposure therapy is one of the few treatments, trauma-focused th treatments, where you don't need to focus on a single traumatic event, but you focus on the full lifeline of a person. So you do not do exposure to the index trauma, but you ask the person to recount the whole life story from the life to the current situation. We did not invent that on ourselves. That is the tradition of testimony therapy um, that has been, that had been there, uh, had been developed in the um, Pinochet regime in, in Chile as um, a means of political activity within psychotherapy. And it has also a means of giving a voice to those who have endured political violence um, and um, um, and wars worldwide. Um, so theoretically, what we aim to achieve with the narrative exposure therapy by going, doing exposure, not just through one event, but also to going to all the events is basically to contextualize not just a single index trauma, but to contextualize these different um, traumatic events and to find what type of reactions belongs to where in time and space of the biography um, of the survivor. That would be the theoretical argumentation. And we could very well include here socially traumatic events as well. Um, that would not need to be restricted to physical traumatic events. Um, we need to have some specifics in treatment in exposure to socially traumatic events, but that could be part of narrative exposure therapy. And um, so the idea is we would contextualize traumatic life events in biography by talking about the traumatic events, by recording the traumatic events, by having written narrations and testimonies, not just on the traumatic events, but on the full biography. And survivors get a small booklet of their own biography home after treatment. Uh, as part of the treatment, also as a way to understand the accumulation of life events in biography and to counteract the speechlessness of trauma within the communities and um, to understand the gradual establishment of a social trauma network within the biography. And finally, I would like to emphasize my team again, and I would like to thank you very much um, for your I guess you had been attentive. I can't see you, unfortunately, but I guess some of you had been attentive. And if you had been attentive, then you hear that I am thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank, for your eye-opening um, talk about uh, treating trauma. There are three questions for you that uh, will be in the chat. But now, uh, please let's uh, listen to Professor Popiel on her view on, on the issues you discuss, and then let's... let's um, have a discussion between the two of you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for uh, thank you very much for this possibility, and uh, thank you, Frank, because uh, obviously I didn't know what you were willing to say, so it was extremely interesting. And I think it's a common beauty of being a clinician if we can use this term in such a um, such a dark topic like post traumatic stress disorder, but of being a clinician that uh, there are those links between theory and then practice and research. And hopefully, if someone is willing to listen, that uh, we can translate it into some policies or some, some indications. Uh, and uh, since I'm uh, uh, the person who is to speak right now, let me add for those, because I also can see on YouTube, 
uh, many people on uh, on uh, on chat that narrative exposure therapy because it has not been mentioned uh, that narrative exposure therapy has been uh, listed in one of the, uh, the recommended treatments by the uh, NICE in UK. So this is one of the treatments uh, recommended for tr the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. So uh, this is especially valuable um, that, uh, um, uh, that there is such treatment and that we have an extra tool because it's one of the four treatments. And um, uh, you structured your lecture with uh, starting with theory and then <clears throat> So let me let me also follow in the discussion uh, that part that uh, yes we have uh, you, you you started the theory part with the problem with single event as the uh, as the one that is uh, to start the post traumatic stress disorder we have the same problem uh, ever because uh, uh, we have the same problem uh, in any clinical practice that many patients have more than one event, then this event does not have to be a, a physical one. And uh, this is a gate criterion. But uh, I also think, and this is just a point to think about, that, uh, that, that this is not a single moment where in classifications in DSM-5 before in DSM-4, but this switch from Dear, oh, there is many things <laughs> uh, with this switch from uh, DSM 4 to 5. There is also no agreement what is the structure of post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a kind of, of agreement of researchers, but with no data, because if you look, but we won't go more in detail into that, because uh, actually the three-factor structure or the seven-factor structure is the most justified, not the four factors one as DSM-5 uh, wants and also uh, then if we uh, so so, uh, so so this is just to mention that there are many many things in theory itself but this is not the workshop about theory and not the webinar about theory. I think that one one thing has been partially solved in treatments because also in such an old treatment like in uh, in a prolonged exposure, this issue of many events is that you can repeat treatments. You usually make, uh, but it, for us, it's always a lot of uh, a lot of effort to uh, efforts to do uh, to 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 ask the patient how what would be this index uh, index trauma. Sometimes we ask, uh, okay, what comes the most in your nightmares? How would you link this and what spoils your life? These are my questions to the patient. What, what memories, the memory of what spoils your life right now the most out of all this horrific uh, past that you had with many events? The same what uh, with um, long lasting childhood uh, abuse, the same we are trying to search for the worst of the worst. Uh, to start the discussion, so 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 this is one of the aspects of the of the single event. But I absolutely agree that uh, there is uh, there are lots of problems, and uh, here this uh, answer that narrative exposure therapy proposes is a very very good one. Very, very, very is the one that that we we have an extra tool. Also, we need to take into consideration when speaking about theory, the moderators like temperament, but uh, here this is a different issue and I'm not going to, um, to, 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 to this topic. And I think that those problems of a single event or definition of a, an event uh, or multiple events, or maybe the events that are not necessarily that traumatic as the definition of criterion A would like them. It raises a question, why do we need to focus on trauma uh, in the treatment? Is it really necessary? So from one hand, I understand uh, um, the development of the criteria because knowing from the patients is very uh, the, 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 the adventure of the trauma treatment is very uh, painful also. So many people avoid. We know that avoidance is uh, 
implicit factor or in, it, it's the basic reaction ba basic symptom is the basic uh, uh, natural reaction when that we don't want treatment that you don't we don't want those memories so we are forcing i'm using this that we are asking our patients to kindly agree to do this treatment it's like surgery I'm a medical doctor, so it's easier to compare that the, this is like a surgery. Nobody wants it, but we need to go over your traumatic experience, the memory of this traumatic experience to understand the meaning you ascribe to that and to understand this structure. And then it depends who believes in what, in what mechanisms, but to, uh, to, 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 to extinguish our anxiety, to change the fear structured or as you said and thank you for this remark as well that this is not only a fear structure it's more like in the bioinformational theory it's an emotion structure that we have and this is where we uh, see emotion all this complexity of emotions and meanings so <clears throat> I think that uh, th th this is one of the pathways Do we ne really need to focus on trauma in the treatment. And uh, of course, right now we know that uh, based on the research that we have so far, that this is the most recommended. But what if the and then we have and let me um, underline uh, the definition of evidence-based practice, that here we have this wonderful treatments and the data that the majority of patients could be helped with those treatments. But what, what if the patient says no? This comes from our own studies on patients that refused treatments because they said, no way that I can come back in my memory to those traumatic events. And that's that's the right as well. And our obligation is to think about treatments, um, uh, treatments that um, in developing new treatments. So of course we have fewer data, but they exist. And uh, this is not this topic, but this is the question for future, uh, for, for, for research, is uh, that there are options. Uh, in psychotherapy, they are not uh, level one evidence, but if not, we can, we can try. But also, and it, uh, it leads this part of the discussion to this, uh, to this uh, aspect of, um, of the reality of refugees reality of patients who might might get this uh, so this was the last part of your speech uh, who deserve this treatment so <clears throat> uh, in um, at least right now in Poland uh, but all over Europe this was the most recent but traumatic events change and and but if we think of the amount of people uh, who uh, like three millions that came to Poland just after the war uh, in in Ukraine we need to think uh, and even if there was a percentage percentage as we find in literature that this is if given that uh, people were traumatized that this these are those amounts like 30% that might be uh, in need for PTSD treatment or trauma related treatment. So this is one aspect that uh, people don't come or they come and cannot undergo psychotherapy because there are no resources. There are no therapists who would do it. So I think this is one of the very important aspects uh, when we are thinking about refugees is the uh, competence uh, competences of the therapist in te of therapists in terms of language in, ter in terms of culture but here <clears throat> uh, we uh, we need to uh, to uh, to, to uh, think also about about those treatments that may be available so let me say let's not forget about pharmacotherapy as well if we are thinking in in the treatment of post traumatic stress disorder because maybe it's not the best it's the second line but it's the most available 
in many many areas and it does not need uh, uh, that, uh, that that advanced uh, uh, linguistic competences and uh, the interp the role of the uh, interpreter is uh, is not uh, so one one aspect is that within the this um, when we think about refugees that there are those treatments, including pharmacotherapy. So we might think of that. And also you mentioned um, coming back for a moment to many events, uh, among them uh, the events that are not defined as traumatic, that cause symptoms, that trigger symptoms that are trauma-related. But let me make another step that uh, if we since the 80s when we think about uh, uh, about trauma uh, uh, about uh, uh, about psychopathology in general there is a diathesis stress model so we think about the whole range of uh, of of uh, disorders uh, that may result from stressors so it's not only ptsd this is basically all psychopathology there is a question can we extend for some minutes so let me i'm just summarizing and maybe we will not need uh, so 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 uh, uh, i love the results of uh, with uh, the vignettes of your study because this is exactly what is the main our main thinking how because refugees deserve the best treatment and this is a beautiful and and sad result that they rarely get the evidence-based treatment because we, the therapists, we have our own thinking. Some of, this, some of this is because of our goodwill, that we are so enthusiastic about treatment that we forget that there is evidence for some and others are not evidence-based. So I think this is our obligation, let me say this, that we need to educate psychotherapists. And this is one of the aspects, I think. Uh, this is this workshop, the, the EBCT workshops, the, what we do in Germany, in Poland. But another aspect, and this is the last sentence, is that ref you said something, I've, uh, I don't have this note, that if refugees don't come, let's go to them. And we really need a psychoeducation. It comes from our... People avoid, basically they avoid. And in the report of WHO for, about Ukrainian refugees, there is that majority of those who suffer never ask for help because of stigma, because of other aspects. So that's uh, thank you for that. And, and uh, I would rather... Uh, regardless of those remarks here, I would stay longer for the conversation, but we have the chat, I think. There is a comment that the results on sequential traumatization of children so should be taken into account. So probably this is a request to your comment. And there is a question does for later <laughs> that uh, mentioned, does, does, did your presentation mean that Shame could be a central emotion for social stress-related PTSD. So probably these are those two questions here. Yes. Sh shall I respond? Uh, it seems so. Okay, okay, okay. Let, let, let me respond to some of your uh, beautiful comments, Agnesha, and to, to the questions uh, in the chat. Uh, I'll make it brief um, and, and, import, and, and focus on the more, most important things. Uh, one, one, gui, one, one key question, I think that is one of the key questions in clinical psychology in general and in psychotraumatology, and you formalized it, um, do we need to focus on the trauma? Uh, which means, do we need um, exposure therapy? Do we need that painful treatment? Um, uh, in my experience, this uh, type of question does not fully cover the problem. Um, because part of the problem is also, um, do we, and that is now the question um, to us, do we, are we ready to do it? Which means, are, are we ready to listen if someone wants to? You know, it, it is quite easy to find a patient who is unwilling to do treatment um, if we are not, <laughs> more or less. So um, in my 
experience, most patients are highly ambivalent uh, when they come to therapy and they give um, two communications at the same time. Um, I never ever want to talk about it, but finally, I would really want to take the chance to talk about it at the same time, uh, which shows their ambivalence. And uh, this, uh, and then the reaction of the clinician is absolutely, uh, is the most important thing, how, how things will be going. Then if you're absolutely clear as a therapist that you are willing to hear it, then the chances are quite high that the person will be willing to disclose. And that is for, in my opinion, not just a matter of um, clinical perspective uh, taking and of efficacy, but it is also a question of humanity. So are we willing to listen to stories? Uh, because that is what, what, what traumatized patients keep carrying along. It's not only that I can't talk about it, but no one really wants to hear it. And um, the f finally the possibility to find someone who is a truly empathic uh, listener to the story can it's it's also a strong social message of evaluation and we have to take that into account i value your story as much and especially for example in narrative exposure therapy where we even write it down so that person is so important that we even document that story uh, in detail and, and, and do a lot of efforts in, in valuing and, and documenting that story. Of course, there are alternatives. There are alternatives. If people don't want, and then they don't want. There is non-trauma focused treatment. There is pharmacotherapy. Um, but uh, on a societal level, I would say for the treatment of refugees, as I've said before, the most important means before I would invest in psychotherapy is I would invest in the way we deal with refugees in general. So that is, do we provide them a fair and valuable chance to feel like an important member in society and to find a perspective here? Or do we keep having these devaluating messages um, and perceiving them or quite often uh, with a lot of racism and a lot of um, downplay? And because that will, of course, maintain their psychological disorders. And probably that is the most important before we think about psychotherapy, the most important thing to do within a society to prevent chronification of traumatic stress reactions. But there are also, I would say, cheap and effective, uh, effective versions of psychotherapy, like narrative exposure therapy that, and we had shown before that we don't even need uh, properly uh, five years trained psychologists to do it. Uh, in principle, that would be possible also for trained uh, lay workers to do the treatment. It, it would not be allowed in Germany, but maybe in other countries that would be allowed. Uh, and I guess it could be considered regarding that high numbers of people in need. And I like the, the surgery analogy that you have said. I think trauma-focused treatment is a kind of surgery and it has to fit into a person's life. So if, if, you're, if it's not the right time, then it's not the right time, then you can postpone the surgery, but it will interfere considerably while you do the treatment. Um, but it is um, the prerequisite for healing. And for one, for one other thing, um, because uh, I, I fully agree, um, prolonged exposure and uh, is, is an excellent treatment. And also there, they are, uh, therapists of prolonged exposure are aware that it's not only a one event, but, but and you can also treat two or three events within prolonged exposure. Um, but uh, uh, in my experience, one um, advantage of such a systematic biographical approach is that you can fully understand the experience of a traumatic event because you know the story of a person as it had been before. Sometimes you simply question why did this person not defend herself in this situation? And you will never understand why she had not defended herself unless you understand how she had been physically abused before by her father 20 years ago and she learned that there's no way in defending yourself. 
and she had re reacted uh, immobile and she had learned um, an, a defensive reaction that's going to be reactivated. So there's an accumulation of defensive reactions and of meaning that occur throughout the li life that is easier to understand if you follow the chronological way. I admit, as Edna Four would say, you have less habituation for single events and that could be a disadvantage. So it has advantages and disadvantages. Um, still, um, I like that type of treatment, obviously. Well, the stones and the flowers that uh, maybe for some people who uh, which are in your treatment, they uh, turn us into really something that is so beautiful in general in, in, in treatment and in cognitive behavioral therapy that you that you have a chance to analyze the meanings of any events. And those flowers are wonderful. So I really appreciate, I mean, all, uh, all, all the aspects of the narrative exposure therapy. So... Uh, Uh, this is the last question to, to, to Frank. Uh, let me read this, or maybe you can. How do we go about cases where the client strongly denies the possible impact of trauma or refuses to explore traumatic event in therapy? It seems that the last part you have uh, partially answered, but uh, the first part, I don't know. When I... Yeah. <laughs> And usually this is not so much of a problem for our clients. So, and sometimes I would also say that um, if, patient, if only the clinician sees the impact of trauma, then I would carefully say maybe it's not there. Um, yes. So, so typically for our clients, um, it is quite obvious, and we we have. So, so, but, but what I would certainly recommend is for any therapy I would do is to have a um, checklist of the most common traumatic event as a screening, as a standard part of diagnosis of a checklist, including different types of child maltreatment and different types of standard events, um, just to make sure that you will see everything that had been there in biography. And um, then... Um, It is, I would say trauma focused therapy is still requires a specific types of symptoms, which would be essentially uh, intrusive symptoms, which means a kind of re-experiencing of these symptoms, which make the relation between traumatic events and current experience and symptoms quite mm -hmm. obvious for both the clinicians and the patient. Mm -hmm. That would be my reply. And uh, let me just say this, certainly shame is a central emotion for social stress related PTSD, maybe the central emotion. Um, I could talk for ages about shame, but not today. Um, but um, the difference in our perspective now is that I don't believe that shame is an event that occurs as a post hoc evaluation of your event, but shame had been present during the event and can be conditioned just as fear during the event and that has implications for treatment you are not just ashamed because you had experienced sexual violence but during sexual violence shame to an intense extent had been there and that becomes conditioned so we need to contextualize this shame within that event also that would be the difference in our perspective here I'm uh, maybe it's not too objective, but I'm happy that this has been recorded because you said so beautifully about refugees and what they deserve for that we can still look at this uh, later on and also some aspects of this because this this was the best summary I think. But uh, but thank you for the possibility of discussing that and I think it's time for Marta to yes. Um, thank you very much to Frank and Agnieszka. I think our audience has um, has been deeply captivated. Uh, these webinars are recorded, yes, um, and it's a useful resource. Um, I think uh, obviously trauma treatment is, is always needed, but it seems now is more than ever with the war is still in Ukraine and then what we what we are witnessing in in Israel and, and Gaza. So um, thank you again and thank you to, uh, to the audience um, and. It's been a great pleasure to listen to both of you. Thank you and good night and good night to the audience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.